So people want a lot of things out of life, but I think perhaps more than anything else, they want happiness. Aristotle called happiness the chief good, the end towards which all other things aim. According to this view, we don't want a big house or a nice car or a good job because these things are intrinsically valuable. We want these things because we think they'll bring us happiness. Now, in the last 50 years, we humans have gotten a lot of things that we want. We're richer, we live longer, we have access to technology that would have seemed like science fiction just a few years ago. The paradox is that even though the objective conditions of our lives have gotten a lot better, we haven't actually gotten much happier. In fact, in America, where I'm from, people haven't gotten any happier at all, which I think is really puzzling. Maybe because these conventional notions of progress haven't delivered big benefits in terms of happiness, there's been a recent、uh, increasing interest in recent years in happiness itself. David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, recently said, "Improving our society's sense of well-being is, I believe, the central political challenge of our times." The question is, how do we do it? People have been thinking and writing about happiness for a long time. In fact, for thousands of years. If you came up with ten smart ideas about happiness, I bet at least nine of them would be something somebody's already thought of. The problem isn't a lack of ideas; it's the inability to determine which of those ideas are right and which of those ideas are wrong. I think you can see that in the self-help industry as well. People have written lots of books offering recipes for happiness. Some of them are surely right; some of them are probably wrong. But we don't have a good way to figure out which are which. If we just rely on our intuition. Or we rely on listening to the voice that's the most charismatic. It's not clear that we'll make much progress. I think science offers us a way out of this problem. Science is slow; it can be painstaking, tedious at times. But over time, science reveals the truth. Now, the thing about science is, in order to study something, you have to be able to measure it. And for a long time, people thought measuring happiness was impossible. We now know that's wrong. In fact, the most effective way we've discovered so far to measure happiness isn't to scan somebody's brain or to put sensors on their body. It's simply to ask people how happy they think they are. I might ask you to rate your overall happiness on a scale from one to ten. In fact, your answer to questions like that would correlate pretty strongly with how your spouse, your friends, your coworkers would rate your happiness. In fact, people who self-report higher levels of happiness do a lot of things we'd expect happier people to do. They smile more often. They're more helpful. They're more tolerant of frustration. They're much less likely to commit suicide. They do have stronger immune systems, as far as the data I've seen, and they have systematic differences in brain activity. As it's become increasingly clear that science is something we can study using the scientific method,、uh, there's really been an explosion in research, which I think is really exciting. One of the main focuses of this research has been studying the demographics of happiness, how things like income and education, gender and marriage relate to it. But one of the puzzles this has revealed is that factors like these don't seem to have a particularly strong effect. Of course, it's better to make more money rather than less, or to graduate from college instead of dropping out. But the differences in happiness tend to be pretty small. Which raises the basic question: What are the major predictors of happiness? I think that's a question that, for the most part, I don't think we've really answered. But I suspect if you think back over the last week or month of your life and thought about what has been most influential on your happiness, it probably wasn't that you made a certain amount of money, or that you had a master's degree, or that you're a man or a woman. Instead, it probably had a lot to do with the interactions you had with other people, maybe a project you were working on, something that you were worrying a lot about. In other words, I suspect your happiness was closely tied to the experiences you had in daily life. Things like what you did, the people you spent your time with, and the things that you thought about. My approach to research capitalizes on this idea. In particular, the idea that the proximal causes of our happiness very often reside in our everyday experiences—not the diploma that's on our wall or the size of our bank account. So, what if we wanted to study this? Sort of approach to happiness scientifically. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could monitor people's experience in real time and see how their happiness goes up and down depending on what they're doing, who they're with, what they're thinking about, and all the other aspects of their experience in real time? A few years ago, I came up with a way to do just that using the iPhone. 
I monitor people's happiness in real time, uh, and I've done it in a way that allows me to gather this kind of data on a really big scale, something that we couldn't do uh, more than a few years ago. Called trackyourhappiness.org, I, I use the iPhone to collect data from lots of people on their experiences in real time. The goal of this project is to try to understand the causes of human happiness with a particular focus on the details of people's experience in everyday life. So let me show you how it works. People start at this website. Is this making a lot of noise? A little bit? OK. So people go to this website, trackyourhappiness.org, and sign up. They answer some basic questions. And then we send them notifications at random times during their day. The reason we want to choose those times randomly is we want to try to get a random sample from all of their different kinds of experiences. So people get these notifications at random times during their day, and they answer a series of questions about their experiences at the moment just before the notification. For example, they might tell me how they feel on a scale ranging from very bad to very good. This is our main measure of happiness, although we have a lot of others as well. We may ask people where they are, at home, at work, in the car, someplace else, whether they're alone, whether they're talking or interacting with other people, how many people they're interacting or talking with, which people those are, how productive they are, what they're doing on a list of activities, including things like eating, watching TV, working, exercising, and if they're doing more than one thing, which of those is their primary activity. Now, this is just a sampling of the kinds of things that we study with this method, but I think it gives you a taste of the sorts of things we're able to measure. Now, I think the great thing about this project is that it's not just a way for us to improve our scientific understanding of happiness. It's also a way to give people personalized insight into the predictors of their own happiness. We give everyone who uses trackyourhappiness.org something we call a happiness report. This shows the relationship between their happiness and a wide variety of different variables. What you do, where you are, who you're with, how focused you are, how much you slept last night, how productive you are, a whole bunch of different variables. The idea is that by systematically tracking your happiness in relation to all these other variables, you can see what are the things that's really moving your happiness around and what are the kinds of situations where you're most and least happy. This can deliver some surprising insights. So it, in my case, one of the things that surprised me the most is that my happiness seems to be unrelated to how much I sleep. Uh, I know that when I get you know, four hours of sleep at night, I'm really tired. Apparently, I'm not any less happy. We've been really fortunate with this project to get quite a bit of press coverage. Uh, all the major Newton's News networks in the US, radio, uh, newspapers, magazines in the US and around the world. And that's generated a lot of data. In fact, really a lot of data. Over 650,000 real-time reports from people's experience from more than 15,000 people. It's not only a lot of people, but it's a diverse group of people. A wide range in age and income and education and marital status and all these other aspects of, of people. They come from every one of 86 different occupational categories and hail from over 80 countries. Together, this has generated just a huge and really exciting database of people's happiness and other details of experience as they report it in real time. Although it's still early in the life of this project, this data has generated some surprising insights. And today, I'd like to talk to you about one of the things that we've been really focused on, which is mind wandering. So human beings have this unique ability to leave the present or to mind wander. Some research suggests this is the brain's default mode of operation. Our ability to focus on things other than the present allows us to learn and plan and reason. We don't know much about our use of this ability and its relationship to happiness. Part of the reason is that it's hard to measure this. People often mind wander without realizing it. So I can't just ask them how much you mind wandered yesterday or last week or last month because people actually don't know. They can't give you an accurate answer. We need to be able to catch them in the act which is exactly what this platform allows me to do. So today I want to show you some data derived from people's answers to three questions. First, a happiness question. How do you feel on a scale ranging from very bad to very good? Second, what are you doing on a list of 22 different activities, including things like working, eating, and watching TV? And finally, are you thinking about something other than what you're doing? You could say no. In other words, I'm focused only on what I'm doing. 
Or, yes, I am thinking about something else, and the topic of those thoughts are pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. Any of those yes responses are what we called mind wandering. So what did we find? I think there were two distinct possibilities, and both of them seemed plausible beforehand. On one hand, people have been uh, suggesting to us for a long time that we should remain in the present, focus on the moment, be here now. You've probably heard that about a hundred times. Maybe these people are right. Maybe mind wandering reduces our happiness. On the other hand, when we allow our minds to wander, they're unconstrained. They can go anywhere. We can't change the physical reality in front of us, but we can go anywhere in our minds. It seems logical that because people want happiness and that their mind wandering is unconstrained, they would choose to go to some place that's happier than the place that they're leaving. Maybe the pleasures of the, of the mind allow us to increase our happiness through mind wandering. So which is it? As it turns out, people are substantially less happy when they're mind wandering than when they're not. This graph shows happiness on the vertical axis, and you can see on the right side, when people are mind wandering, their happiness was substantially lower. In fact, a lot lower than a lot of other things that you might think are important for happiness. Now, you might imagine that even if mind wandering is associated with lower happiness on average, surely people are happier when they're mind wandering away from something that isn't very enjoyable. In fact, that turns out not to be the case. No matter what people are doing, even the least enjoyable things, they're less happy when they're mind wandering than when they're not. For example, people don't really enjoy their commute to work very much, but it turns out they're still considerably happier when they're just focused on their commute than when their mind is off thinking about something else. But we didn't just ask people whether they were mind wandering, we also asked about the valence of those thoughts. This graph shows you how happiness varies depending on whether the topic of those thoughts is unpleasant, neutral, or pleasant, or whether people weren't mind wandering at all. As you can see, a big part of the reason that mind wandering is associated with less happiness is because of that category, unpleasant mind wandering, that really short bar when people are worrying, you know, anxious about something, maybe thinking about something they regret, happiness is dramatically lower. I think that's the single biggest difference in happiness I've seen in this entire data set. But it's not just when people are thinking about unpleasant things. You'll notice the neutral bar is still considerably lower than when people are, aren't mind wandering. In fact, even when people are thinking about something pleasant, they're still a little bit less happy than when they aren't mind wandering. If mind wandering were a slot machine, it'd be like having the chance to lose $50, $20, or $1 and never win, right? You'd never play. I've been talking about mind wandering and happiness as if mind wandering causes unhappiness, but all I've really shown you is that these two things are correlated, right? What's going on? It's also possible that maybe people mind wander whenever they're unhappy. Maybe causation goes in the opposite direction. But how could we ever disentangle these two factors? There's a very simple fact I think you'll all agree with that we can use to understand this, and that's the fact that time only flows forward. The cause has to come before the effect. Since I get repeated responses from people, I can look and see, does mind wandering precede unhappiness, or does unhappiness precede mind wandering? Well, as it turns out, there's a strong relationship between mind wandering now and being unhappy in the future. In contrast, there's no relationship between being unhappy now and mind wandering in the future, suggesting that mind wandering is very likely a cause of unhappiness and not merely a consequence of it. Now, a few minutes ago, I likened mind wander to a slot machine that you never want to play. So one of the interesting questions is, how often do people do this? It turns out they do it a lot. In fact, they really do it a lot. 47% of the time, people said they were thinking about something other than what they were doing. When we look at the rate of mind wandering by different activities, we see that there is some variation. So the total height of these bars shows you the likelihood of mind wandering during each of these 22 different activities. On the high end, we see that about 65% of the time, people are mind wandering when they're brushing their teeth or taking a shower, down to 50% when they're working, 40% when they're exercising, and then all the way down on the low end, just 10% when people are having sex. So 
So this graph has a lot of information, but I want to call your attention to two facts. One is that the rate of mind wandering for virtually every activity is above 30%. That's what that black line is showing you, which I think suggests that mind wandering is something that's frequent. It's ubiquitous. It pervades all of our experiences. Probably some of you are mind wandering right now, and I won't hold it against you. The other thing that I want to point out has to do with the valence of mind wandering. The height of these bars, the green, red, and blue, show the mind wandering to pleasant, neutral, and unpleasant topics. As it turns out, there's no relationship, virtually, between the activity that someone's engaged in and the valence of their mind wandering. When you're doing something really enjoyable, your mind is less likely to wander, but it's just as likely to think about something bad when it does. Which I think suggests that happiness is influenced by two important, but mostly separate, things. On one hand, the activities that we engage in, and on the other hand, the content of our wandering minds when we leave those activities. In our lives, we often make deliberate choices about the things we do, the activities we engage in, we plan our weekend around seeing the movies, maybe having dinner with friends or spending time with our kids. But we don't often make a deliberate choice about mind wandering, about whether to let our minds wander, what to think, where to let our mind go. Yet these data suggest that this might have a powerful influence on happiness. In my talk today, I've focused on mind wandering, which is one variable I think turns out to be quite important in the equation of happiness. But I hope I've also shown you that happiness is something we can come to understand using the methods of science. My hope is that a scientific understanding of happiness will help us create a future that's not only richer and healthier, but happier as well. Thank you.